Hello, dear friends. We are sincerely glad to welcome you again. And today we are going to talk to the esteemed Igor Mikhailovich Danila. Greetings. Igor Mikhailovich, our viewers have been expressing sincere gratitude to you again for the experiment and the series of videos within the framework of this experiment, because they share that it's a fount of knowledge and discoveries, above all, inner discoveries. As they said, these videos are like a mirror that was put in front of you, and you finally took an honest look inside yourself, an honest look at what is going on in your inner world in general, and you saw this inner L of yours face to face. Some people also shared that it was a huge discovery, shocking at times, that those things which they believed to be themselves turned out to be manifestations of consciousness after all. There is also another point, and I would like to return to our discussion of the experiment and its results. Because there was a category of comments that said the following. It would be good to free people from the influence of consciousness, and various ways were suggested. Among them, there were versions suggesting that maybe it would be enough to have just the influence of his own consciousness on a human. After all, one also has subpersonalities, and there is an influence of third forces. Why not liberate people from the influence of those very subpersonalities? Put all subpersonalities to the second death, using that very virtue or the eye of God, or at least detect some of the most active subpersonalities and deactivate them. And of course, a question arises. Do such tools as the Eye of God or Vajra allow one to see the structures of subpersonalities and perform such manipulations at all, so to speak, to turn off subpersonalities and the activity? I understand, our friends. The question is actually important, especially for those who are really conscientiously engaged in their own development, including, let's say, not only spiritual, but also intellectual one. Curiosity. A human differs from animals by the fact that he has curiosity. As a matter of fact, a human will always learn and he must continue learning to infinity. In other words, a human cannot stop in his own development, in understanding and perception of this world. And we have so much to learn. The world is so unexplored, it is so deep, and even our inner world is almost impossible to perceive within a human lifetime. Even though our inner world of us as humans is very simple, but for us at this stage of development and understanding of the knowledge that we possess, it is very complicated. Thus, there is a paradox. On the one hand, it is very simple, but on the other hand, it is very complicated. But curiosity distinguishes humans from almost all creatures that exist in this world. Even though they are spiritualized, they are not soul-filled, whereas the presence of a soul contributes not only to our development as personality, but also to the development of our consciousness. Consciousness always strives to develop, but this is due to the fact that this very aspiration to know this world and to develop is inherent of personality. And it should be understood that all these questions that arise, they arise not without reason. Naturally, it would seem to one, well, there are subpersonalities or there are no subpersonalities. But a person is interested in getting to the truth, to the essence, especially when a person himself already understands, knows, and has experience of the very fact that all this is really true, that people who once lived are not somewhere underground in some hell, but that we people living now are actually the gate to heaven and the bearers of hell. So everything is in us. And we really are perfect. This is the truth. However, if we look at how the world is arranged and how strong the system is, I'm digressing from your question a little bit, but I think it's important for our friends to know. Then if we take a look at how the system works, it blocks, first of all, the ability of our development, our craving for knowledge. What is the first thing that kills craving for knowledge and exploration of the world? It is alcohol and drugs. Why? Because when a person consumes these toxins, there is no other way to call them. They contribute to a disruption of connection and again affect the neurons of his brain. After we consume even 50 grams of that very vodka or cognac, it doesn't matter. But a hard liquor, 
This drink, after its consumption, leaves a whole graveyard of neurons in our brain, while the rest are getting blocked in huge numbers, which means that we as Personality already do not perceive this world. Our primary consciousness is unable to convey a holistic picture of this world. And this is where an animal awakens in us. Why? Because secondary consciousness has access to us, to Personality, almost like in certain phases during sleep. Information is conveyed with huge distortions, and we no longer perceive this world the way it actually is. That's why it happens that intelligent, educated people sit down at the table, and after drinking just one shot, they begin to turn into animals. As a rule, it all ends in a beastly and pig-like state of these once highly educated people. But are these people capable of analysis and striving for knowledge? No. And I say it again, no. They are incapable of making any discoveries. This is true. All they are capable of is repulsive actions, plagiarism, self-care and egoism, which is expressed in their aspiration to climb this social ladder, to get some titles or awards for nothing, and so forth. And it is interesting that they lose both empathy and responsibility for other people. Why? Because selfishness begins to predominate in them, but they no longer have a thirst for knowledge and self-development. Then the system often uses such tools that it loads people with so many problems, overfilling their life with pressing, petty problems, and a person immersed in these problems simply drowns in them. He has no time for self-development, he has a lot of problems, he just wants to survive somehow. And this is also a very serious tool of the system itself, aimed at stopping our development. But as soon as a person embarks on the spiritual path, doesn't consume either alcohol or drugs, and begins to balance his life, he balances his condition at least a little bit, and a huge fount of knowledge opens up before him, which cannot be explored even in his entire life, and an aspiration for knowledge appears in him. Hence, a mass of seemingly unnecessary questions arise. Again, all this is due to the natural aspiration of us as Personality for continuous development. And even if these questions seem ridiculous, they are very relevant. Is it possible to notice, to detect those subpersonalities with this tool, let alone to resist them? I will put it this way. People are simply omitting the analysis. I mean, those people who have such a question do not analyze things comprehensively on their own, but seek to get the answer. What does this indicate? This indicates that we want to know a comprehensive answer. Yes, a thirst for knowledge has awakened in us, but there is no analysis or aspiration for deep personal learning through experience yet. That is, consciousness is still strong, I mean the one who is behind it. Yet consciousness is precisely the tool of the system itself, while it is us who are supposed to develop through our consciousness, and it is us who must dominate it. Curiosity from Personality is present, but there is still not much of a desire to study. I mean, we do not subject things to deep analysis, do not study and literally do not compare the details which give a complete picture. But this is already good. Why? Because it suggests that these people are already humans, not just creatures in this world. So, friends, I apologize for such a prologue, to this conversation, but I felt it was necessary. It also gives an understanding of what to work on, in what direction, and how to approach information. We already answered this question, but I'll repeat. It is possible, with tools like the Eye of God or Vajra, to influence neurons of the brain, the mechanism of their work. However, Subpersonalities are non-neuronal, 
They have no body at all, and in our understanding they are immaterial. But on the other hand, they are material, they are in this material world, and they really exist in it. Yes, they are one dimension higher, but the fact remains, they are here. Therefore, we cannot use this tool to detect subpersonalities. But can we resist them? Here, there is a paradox. We cannot see them, but we can resist them. Again, if an active subpersonality seeks to dominate in a human, as in a new personality living in a body, but at the same time the subpersonality is strong, it has a lot of energy and it is active, any replacement of either consciousness or personality will be through the neural group. In other words, the brain is still involved, and it is these neurons that the subpersonality tries to subdue. Also through them, it will still impact our levels of perception. That's important too. Why is it important? Because this tool is the linking one. Or let's put it simply, can a person's memory be influenced? No. With this tool, with Vajra, it's impossible to influence memory. Yet, we can make a person forget a certain moment of time, temporarily or permanently, at the choice of an operator. The one who is behind using this tool. That's really true. Why? Because memory comes to us as personality, not from the brain, but through it, through neurons, through certain groups of those neurons. And by blocking them with the help of Vajra, we can make a person forget one or another moment of his life. So you see how it turns out, we can influence both memory and manifestation of a subpersonality. But it's impossible to see subpersonalities. The eye of God will not be able to detect them. It can detect a person at any point. Why? Because a human actually consists not only of neurons of the brain, but neurons are scattered throughout the body. And neurons are very interesting structures, which, in the human energy structure itself, have a linking role. They do not only transfer information about the state of our body, our mental state or emotional state, let's say, not only those hormonal manifestations that occur, although our hormones also manifest themselves to a certain extent thanks to neurons. So it's a very important and necessary tool. But another important thing is that these neurons emit and transceive Again, they work both for transmission and for reception. A special kind of energy. Whether it is so special, it's a good question, of course. But let's say, it is precisely this energy that Vajra manipulates. And it is exactly this energy that the so-called Eye of God perceives. What is the Eye of God and Vajra? Well, I would put it simply. It is the same transmitter. Receiver and transmitter. Nothing more. Sort of a radio or a radio station through which we can both receive a signal and transmit it. It's a simple tool. And today I will not reveal a big secret if I say that all of us use it to a certain extent. This tool has existed for a very long time, to a certain degree. Why? Because any gadget in your pocket, whether it's a phone, a computer, a TV set, or whatever else it is, actually a more tangible manifestation of this tool. Your brain, indeed, exactly, your brain is actually the Eye of God and Vajra. And we use them every day, both to receive a signal and to transmit it. There is another very interesting thing. A human is not just, let's say, a set of cells or coarse material manifestations of some complex energies, like everything else in this world. But it's a very interesting structure that constantly interacts with any matter in this world. In reality, all our matter in the entire infinity of this ocean of life is interacting 
And in fact, even dead planets live, they exist in this universe. And that stone which flies seemingly far, far away in a completely different galaxy, directly interacts with every tiny neuron of our brain. And every person can be seen, I mean everyone who possesses neurons. But here I want to emphasize that only soul-filled beings are visible, while spiritualized ones cannot be seen. And there's a paradox here too. Why? Because a different kind of energy is used in that case, a much coarser one. It is, I would say, intermediate between our gadgets and our tool, so to speak. The one we call the Eye of God or Vajra, and the work of our neurons. In this case, the kind of energy is almost the same. I'll give you an example for comparison. Our computer, for example, or our phone through which we communicate with each other, uses energy in the form of elephants. Just to make it clear, in other words, we transmit information in elephants. Those elephants fly from one box to another, again, through intermediate devices, those very cellular stations and everything else. So this information passes from one box to another, and we hear each other. It's a set of elephants. But elephants are made of very small ants. And what we call Vajra, that energy which the neurons of our brain work on, are exactly the ants. Is this interesting? It's very interesting. And in fact, it is so, no matter how you look at it. Yet, there is another interesting piece of information, and it proves that what I'm saying now is true. I guess we will come to this point later. I don't want to put everything in one basket at once, so that there is an understanding. But there is also an intermediate kind of energy. Let's call it a dog, just to make it clear. Ants, dogs and elephants. And these elephants that we now use for our understanding represent that energy which our phones and computers work on, they namely exchange information, whereas dogs represent that kind of energy on which neurons work in animals. If we take a look at neurons, under a microscope we will practically see the same thing. We will see a similar structure of neurons, which is almost no different in monkeys and in humans, and it is no different in pigs. However, we are not pigs. Do they have a basic memory? Of course they do. Even if we look at ants, we will find neurons in them too, in small numbers, but functionally they are the same as our brain. Yes, they also seem to work on an electrical signal, but the difference is huge. I mean, that information which we process and transmit does not depend on the number of neurons. The number of neurons only expands the possibilities. However, a human being is arranged in a very interesting way. And in a human, the ability to replace some neurons with others is very high. This is really so. This has been mentioned more than once, both in medicine and by great doctors, who observed quite normal sane people, who had virtually no brain, but they continued to function, and neither their memory nor cognitive abilities or anything else suffered, right? In other words, people were practically normal. But looking inside their head on a CT scan or an MRI, people were astonished. That wasn't supposed to take place. Why? Because there were virtually no neurons, while the miserable quantity that remained adapted. Yes, these people would still be different. They would be different for the fact that they wouldn't have such a craving for knowledge. The information throughput would be slightly lower. But the substitution, meaning the adaptive response in human neurons, is much higher than the same adaptive response in those creatures who are not soul-filled, but spiritualized, let's say. It doesn't matter whether it's a fish or a butterfly, for example. And there is a difference in that too. Why? Because a different kind of energy is used in the exchange between neurons. And the paradox is that a soul-filled, any soul-filled person, or human-like one, shall we say, while human-like means having personality, 
consciousness and the soul. These are the three components that we actually call a human being. I mean, these are the necessary components for a human to become a human. And there will be a neural group here in any case. Thus, if a person is not so highly developed as to transition into another form of existence, such a person with these neurons will be seen on that very Vajra or by that very system, because it uses exactly this kind of energy, as paradoxical as it may be, but the system is different, for the fact that it is able to operate not only with ants, but, sadly enough, also with dogs and even elephants. Why? Because it interferes, and this is also easily proved. Literally, everyone can check it and everyone has encountered that, but we'll discuss it a little later. So, going back to the understanding, can we see subpersonalities? We cannot. It's a different form of existence of the one who used to be a human being. And there is no paradox here. There is personality, there is consciousness, but there is no brain. There is a soul, but the soul is no longer theirs, which means they cannot directly use that power, that energy, which comes from the soul to personality. But only, excuse me, like heat from a stove, nothing more. In other words, there is no direct connection with the soul, what is called the silver thread. This is also very significant, and this was known since ancient times. The funniest thing, I think, I won't discover America if I say that this is scientifically proven nowadays. And the absence of memory in our brain is also a fact. Now, there is a question. Can we use these tools in order to somehow influence subpersonalities? That's already an interesting question. A very interesting one. Yes. We can really influence them. Why? Because we can block a certain group of incoming thoughts that can have an impact. In other words, we can cut off or increase the supply of energy. Excuse me, I'll explain it in such a simple language. It is kind of like, let's say, water flowing through a floodgate. If we open it, more water passes through. If we close it, the water doesn't pass through. In the same way, by influencing a neural group, we can block consciousness, and subpersonalities will have more or less energy left. This way we can activate or deactivate subpersonalities in a person. That's also interesting. Stop the impact, yes. Igor Mihalovich, you have also slightly touched upon the issue of thoughts. We were also asked another question. Can such a tool as Vajra or the Eye of God read another person's thoughts? After all, many people wanted to look into the heads of rulers or their acquaintances, or in particular, if we talk about rulers or powers that be, people wanted to see what strategy they have in their heads, what they are thinking about. Does such a tool as Vajra or the Eye of God allow allowed to carry out such a function? Well, let's put it this way. It is possible to see what's in one's head. Actually, this is what the eye of God is aimed at. What can we see? For instance, we can see the state of a particular person in what condition he is, whether he consumed alcohol or drugs, whether he is excited, the dominance of certain hormones in him, his physical state, whether a person is sick or not, in general, the reaction of his body, that's precisely what neurons are responsible for. Also, we can see what a person is thinking about at the moment, but we will not be able to see the strategy, the plans of a person, of that very politician, what he is going to do or what he is planning. All we can see is the same things we have in our heads, what we are thinking about, I mean, yes, you can see, well, excuse me for a banal example, whether this politician wants to go to the toilet now, whether he wants to eat, whether he is thirsty, or he is in some kind of a playful mood, or conversely, in a dreary one. This is due to hormones, emotions and the like. This is all we can see. But will we be able to see his strategy, let's suppose, on a particular issue? Friends, I will disappoint you. We won't. 
Why? Because even this politician doesn't know it. Because the thoughts he receives come to him. That's the whole answer. I mean, he kind of perceives and understands, and he even thinks it over. But is it him who thinks it over? And here, I think, lies the biggest mystery that doesn't give rest to a lot of people who are engaged in studying our psyche and the structure of our brain in general. Where thoughts come from, how they come, and where they go afterwards. They are definitely not in our head. Yes, they come. But in what form do they come? And again, can we see a specific thought? Yes, we can. Do you understand what the paradox is? We will not see a strategy, but we can see a specific thought. To put it simply, is it possible to read a person's thoughts? It's a relevant question for many people. Yes, and to somehow influence this thought by means of these tools. Yes, it is possible, moreover, directly. I'll give a simple example. Imagine a white cow. Have you imagined it, friends? So, if you were in a PET scanner now, and we could see the neurons of your brain, the ones that are activated when you are thinking of a white cow, we would register them. I mean, those particular areas. Then we would ask you to think of a black cow. No, please, think of a black cow. It's the same cow, but of a different color. The paradox is that these are almost the same neurons, but with an addition of a few more and an exclusion of a few. And here, on this difference, we would already see what you are thinking of, a black cow or a white one. And in fact, that very artificial intelligence on which the eye of God operates would easily identify that. And in this case, we can judge, by the work of neurons, what a person is thinking of, a white cow or a black one. Can we influence this? Of course we can. We can turn off perception of the concept of a cow in a person at all. Then a person looking at a cow, no matter what color it is, white or black, will not see the cow at all. For him, a cow will be some kind of a twisted camel or a weird horse, but not a cow. And he will never understand the difference between a cow and a horse, or between a cow and a camel, you see, because he will have everything mixed up. He will not be able to tell the difference between a cow and a camel in a photograph or live. He will be sure that this is a camel or a horse, but not a cow. In other words, this is possible. However, will this tell us about the whole strategy that is unfolding supposedly in our head? No, it won't. Because strategies do not unfold in our head. Pictures are registered in us, and our brain, our neural group, perceives solely pictures. It models and creates them. Just observe yourselves, how you are thinking and how a thought is spreading in you, where it is located. Meanwhile, we as personalities are able to perceive exactly the location of our thought, where it is registered, where it manifests itself into a picture, and how we perceive the world, here we should understand that the center of our visual and auditory perception is the brain. That is why most often we identify ourselves, our location in the body, exactly in the head. But it's enough to close our eyes, for example, and stay in silence, and we realize that we cannot find ourselves in the body, but at the same time we can feel ourselves at any point of our body. If we approach this more carefully and do not direct ourselves by the power of our thought to one or another point of our body, but really just relax and observe where we are, we will actually find ourselves outside our head. Look how interesting it is, right? We will see where we are, where our thoughts are, where, which side they come from. We will see those patterns. Why does one group of thoughts, solely the one that causes certain reactions, chemical reactions in our body, emotions, for example, negative ones, always come from the right side? Why does something that has to do with some, I don't know, cunning or deceit, come from the left side? Why does the past always come from behind and a little bit from the front? From the front, because we see it in the front, it is sort of a screen. And it is hard for us to imagine a screen behind our head. It doesn't matter, let's say, which side a picture manifests itself from. 
Well, it does matter, because everything is in its place. We have a kind of projector in our head. That is neurons. But we see a picture as a whole, we do not see it pixelated, like one neuron lights up, then another one, the way a TV set displays it. Of course not. We perceive it all the way we see it here. And very often, as in the example with the cow, if our brain doesn't know something, it completes and substitutes it, and often with something that wasn't there. We haven't heard something well, and our brain completes it. You know, like a neural network, builds up what is missing. And this is also a function of our consciousness, but not of our brain. We have just been saying, our brain, and wherever you look, they say that our brain is capable. But in fact, the only thing it is capable of is to influence the chemistry of our body, the perception of pictures, and to be an intermediary between our consciousness, our personality, and our subpersonalities. Well, that's the truth of life. This is interesting indeed, and it is necessary and important to learn. We should know who we are and how we are arranged, right? And the paradox is that we always strive to know someone else's thoughts, but we don't even know where ours come from and where they go. Igor Mihailovich, why are people nevertheless interested in the question of whether someone can read our thoughts? Because people often face the fact that, all of a sudden, they can see what they have thought of on the screen of their smartphone or on the screen of their tablet. And, of course, such opinions and beliefs arise that someone actually reads our thoughts, and even devices can read these thoughts and manipulate information this way. Of course they can. And here we have come precisely to where I started the conversation. Look, I understand that you've been preparing, but it is you who have been preparing. Whereas I was talking about the course of development of our conversation, right? We can guess and say, Since we expected this conversation, I aligned it somehow, I made some kind of a plan for our conversation, right? But how can you answer the following question? For example, you're scrolling through TikTok on your way home, and you happen to see someone starting to eat a bowl of dumplings, okay? Just dumplings. That's funny, isn't it? You've never come across it before, at least for a month. You come home, and there is a bowl of dumplings on your table. Is this a coincidence? Wow, that's a question. Or a synergy. What is it? What is it? And here, like what you've said, we often noticed that modern appliances, our phones, kind of spy on us, right? I mean, it's not a secret, marketing, business and so on, all sorts of security services collect information. Well, it's understandable, it's normal. So, if we are sitting and talking about something, we have discussed, for example, that we want to buy slippers or a fridge. Let's take a simple example. I'm thinking about buying slippers. So, I'm discussing what slippers I should choose, and Tatiana says, slippers, that's good, but let's buy a fridge. And we are discussing what kind of fridge to buy. Later on, on our own phones, which were inactive, but we're near us, we start seeing advertisements on various social media about both slippers and fridges. That's explainable. Well, it's quite explainable. In devices, regardless of whether they are active or not, there are microphones, they listen, artificial intelligence pulls it all up, and we begin to receive advertisements of what we've been talking about. Yet, there's a simple question, many people encountered this, and more than once, when a thought comes to a person, that is, he's thinking, For example, about that very fridge, he doesn't voice it. The conversation is about something completely different, but the person keeps thinking that he needs to buy a fridge, or he has a problem with his fridge and needs to replace it. So, he opens his phone and gets a bunch of ads. The question is, can a phone already read thoughts? When we think about a fridge, yes, we have images in our head. And basically, with the help of the eye of God, yes, those images can be identified, if they are contained in the artificial intelligence of this device, right? Then we can manipulate, but is there such a technology as of today? No. How to explain this? And the explanation, friends, is very simple. It is called synergy. In other words, we can really exert an influence with our thoughts, but in certain states and at a certain phase. That is, 
our neural group operates with ants, which make up dogs and elephants. Thus, can we mentally command an animal to do something? Yes, friends, we can. We can impose our picture in the head. For instance, we mentally create a phantom. We imagine something. By correctly using a technique, we are not going to talk about that now, it's not necessary. But still, by correctly performing certain techniques that have been used for thousands of years by various mages, various lamas and the like, we can cause certain reactions in an animal. Let's recall those very Bechtere, Duro or Pavlov. These are the people who really worked with animals. That's just off the top of my head, let's put it so. But there were many others too who conducted experiments where they gave orders to animals without any kind of gestures, emotions or anything else, but only with thoughts. And the animals performed those actions. Why? Because neurons in those very animals work on the energy that you and I, friends, have conventionally called the dogs, okay? I mean, by its form. But the dogs are made of ants, of those ants that our neurons work on. Clearly, if we just keep repeating it to ourselves, giving an order, a dog won't do it. But using special techniques, purely mental ones, we can force an animal to do what we need it to do. This is really true. So, synergy does exist. And each of our thoughts, if it is directed to someone, is perceived by that person to whom it is addressed. The only question is whether it is read by that person's consciousness later on and how it is read, as your message or as some form or something else. Here again, it depends on the technique of transmitting this thought and on the state of the person whom you are sending your thought to. But have we not faced this phenomenon? We have faced it thousands of times. And an overall synergy exists. Again, every time, millions of people face it every day. When you haven't recalled your classmate or kindergarten friend for 50 years, but then suddenly you've remembered him, and he calls you, right? Or you take two steps and see him. How to explain this from the perspective of logic? In no way. Did you see him around the corner? No. Were you going to call him? No, you didn't even think about him. And then, all of a sudden, you remembered him, and he calls you. How to explain that? Yes, there are interconnections. And the whole world is interconnected. And in certain states, such overlaps can happen when we do not even know and cannot use that very mobile phone. But we accidentally, like a monkey, tap on the keys and we may accidentally dial some random number that we have accidentally tapped, right? And it may turn out to be the number of an acquaintance whose phone number we didn't know, so to speak. Can such a thing happen? It can. Well, such a happenstance occurs often to us too. The mechanism is a little bit more complicated. But basically, it is like this. That is, being in a certain state, when we are distracted by something, we get some thought without even giving importance to it. As I've said, we are scrolling through some, I don't know, news feed on our phone, and we see a bowl of dumplings popping up. We come home, and there it is. Is it a sign, an accident, or a coincidence? But when there are a lot of such coincidences, and the most interesting thing is that the more you perceive these coincidences, the more you study all this, the more you see them. That's also interesting. Why? Because you are already learning how to manipulate ants. Isn't that interesting? It's very interesting that it turns out to be synergy not only with soulless creatures, but also specifically with objects, right? I and mean, not only with creatures, even with a stone, the whole world. With all gadgets. Of course, the whole world is arranged in a very interesting way, I'll put it simply. If we look at the hypothesis that was presented at the last forum, I mean the snakes, what the world consists of, about their linear and coiled states, well, 
is a very simplified model, but it describes the world order. And imagine, the whole world consists of this. Well, it all has one form, one essence. But the snakes, that's not all. These snakes are just a manifestation of a certain energy, yet who gives them one or another characteristic? Who changes their places and makes them move in one or another direction? And here we come to the essence of things. We come to information. I mean, what we call information. It is that kind of energy, let's call it so. Although, it's already difficult to call it this way. But on the other hand, it is energy. It's a force. It is more of a force than energy. However, can we possess this particular force? I will put it like this. Humanity is capable of possessing this force, and we do possess it. We really do. But we'll be able to use it rationally and consciously, like those very ants in the eye of God, in Vajra, or in something else. Only, at least at the fifth level of development of civilization. And in fact, we are not even a civilization yet. But we already want that, and we strive for this cognition. That's what distinguishes a human being, curiosity and aspiration, to cognize this entire world order, what and how cause and effect relationships to detect even those very subpersonalities. After all, it is interesting how they live. By the way, Subpersonalities are energy informational structures, let's put it so. Yes. They cannot be detected by means of Vajra or the Eye of God. But we were asked questions like, is there any way to understand whether they are in you, how many of them there are in you, and what they are like? Are there such tools at all to look in there and to see if you have subpersonalities, how many of them there are, if they are active or not, and what impact they have? I understand the question, of course. A person wants to know, whether his soul is pure or impure, whether there are subpersonalities in him, you have to agree. You live, and at the same time you… How many of you there are in the communal part? Eventually realize that you are actually… Not alone. Not in your own body, but in some communal apartment, and moreover, only you pay. Well, they don't. It's kind of unfair, and you already want to know how many of these cohabitants there are in you. I'll put it this way. In reality, since ancient times, there has existed a method. And it is very simple. Human abilities are enormous, but again, it is necessary to create conditions. And the conditions are simple. The same thing that was often used in magic, but in the past they used copper that was very well polished, then copper coated with silver and very well polished. And later, when mirrors appeared, they started using mirrors. Why? Because they have a reflective capacity and it's extremely important. But here certain conditions have to be met. It is interesting, I understand. Everyone can try it. Simple actions. You sit on a chair. You must have your legs straight, I mean, placed at 90 degrees. And you have to sit with your back upright. There should be a mirror in front of you. Basically, you can use a full-length mirror that is on a wardrobe door, depending on who has what, but the mirror shouldn't be above your knees. That's what is important. It should be either lower or at knee level, and not lower than your head. This is clear, isn't it? So the mirror has to be in such a position that you may see yourself completely in it. Your head, a little bit above your head, and your knees, that's important. Next, they always used a splinter back then, and later they used candles. That is, a small source of light, but it is better to use a candle, there are no problems. You can take an ordinary thin church candle, and put it on a stand of some kind, for your convenience. But the candle should burn exactly at the level of the solar plexus. This is important. Higher or lower will give distortions. Why? We understand that it is light, right? I mean, light is not only reflected in the mirror, but it is also reflected from us, in our eyes. In other words, we perceive it. It's important. It's a distribution of light. So, you just need to sit down, calm down, like in autogenic training, that is basically the same autogenic training to remove unnecessary thoughts, to remove unnecessary emotions. It's better to put your hands on your knees quietly, just to relax, to sit down, in the dark. Darkness must be complete, it is one of the conditions. There must be no other sources of light, except this candle between you and the mirror. It's important that the distance between you, meaning between your solar plexus, 
and the mirror should not be farther or closer, but approximately from 3 to 3.3 feet. That's an important point. And exactly in the middle of this distance, there should be a candle. Let's take 3 feet. It is more convenient to count this way. Why? If it is farther away, a distortion occurs. If it is closer, distortions happen as well. This is banal physics, there is nothing complicated here. It is clear the candle is at the level of your solar plexus. When observing it, a little bit farther away, you will distort the picture. If you get closer, the candle gets closer, the light is distributed incorrectly, and a distortion also occurs. In order to conduct this experiment really easily and really get results, you need to follow these simple rules. So the candle is at the solar plexus level, in the middle, 1.5 feet away from you and 1.5 feet to the mirror. You should just sit down, calm down, and look solely in the eyes of your mirror reflection, meaning it's important not to let your gaze wander around your body and not to evaluate anything, not to cling to a single thought, not to think about how you look or how the candle is burning, not to contemplate how its flame is flickering, nothing. Just look into your eyes, without taking your eyes off, keeping your peripheral vision fixed behind the candle, that is, precisely on the mirror, you focus your gaze a little bit below the solar plexus, precisely with the peripheral vision, but your gaze is directed eye to eye. And here you begin to understand how freaking, alluring magic is, and that even atheists, now, while I was telling you about this method, began to listen very attentively, even those who do not believe either in God or in the devil, but your consciousness is listening to this magical nonsense very attentively. After all, so many interesting things were told before that, and your consciousness didn't strain that much. Well, here it was about to write everything down. Why? Because this is magic. This is a force. It is that force which creates this world, that force which controls information, or, to be more correct, it is this very information that creates those snakes and makes them move in one direction or another, switch from the linear state to the coiled one, create forms of matter, change matter, and influence our relationships. Why? Because it is power. And what does power give? Vril. Whereas Vril is what every person pays for his existence to that peak called a demon. And that's it. Thus we come to understand the structure of this world. A very simple example to you, friends. Our consciousness is very hungry for anything that can give us secret power or explicit power, just because you will be able to get more Vril. While Vril is what your consciousness, the demon in you, needs, and the demon is a bottomless stomach. No matter how much you feed him, he will never have enough. And no matter how much power you have, the demon will press you more and more, no matter how much real you give him, he will press more and more. Now let's go back. In one of the videos we discussed L with you, friends, that indeed he was a radiant person, the best of the best. He practically had one foot in paradise. He helped people a lot, and everyone loved him. And people, having plunged into chaos, into a really unmanageable process, in order to stabilize it and improve their own lives, put him in charge of them and gave him tremendous power. And this angel in flesh turned into a fallen angel, a Lucifer, a devil. Well, this is said in legends, and so it is in real life. In other words, the man, who was really almost an angel, became Satan's publican in order to merely feed pigs. His own consciousness and those demons that predominated in him, think about this, to waste life, to trade the future, to trade eternity for feeding pigs. This cannot be compared eternity and being a publican. And why? Because consciousness merely wants to eat. And that is why magic is so attractive, as a tool of power, giving Vril. 
This is very illustrative, Igor Mihalovich, to trade an opportunity to become a source for being just a publican of the system. Of course. Igor Mihalovich, thank you very much for the experiments and for this experiment as well, because our viewers asked us in the comments that it would be great if Igor Mihalovich conducted such educative experiments, because in a very clear and illustrative way in the online mode, people understand their entire inner essence, they understand where the system hooks them and how to improve themselves even more on the spiritual path, what else to work on, as they say in themselves, on what aspects. And truly, thank you very much for such lessons in the online mode, because it brings us closer, closer to the source, to the source of life. And this is the most important point. Right. Every step we take in this world should bring us closer to God. And there is no better and faster way than accumulating God's love. Therefore, friends, let's just love each other. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, friends. Peace and God's love be with you.